Um, thanks for coming to the first event of the Menard Family Lecture Series. I'm Steve Goman. I'm the director of the Center for Free Enterprise. And the mission, our mission is to engage in research and teaching that explores the role of enterprise and entrepreneurship in advancing the well-being of society. And so what do you think that really means? It's really examine why businesses are successful. And they're successful because they serve their fellow man. They produce things that we want. They make us better off, and that makes them better off. And so this semester, we have three events that kind of are on that theme to some extent. At least I'm going to argue they are. And so our second event is going to be on March 1st, and it's going to be a, two, it's going to be a movie screening of two short movies uh, with the two producers, Robert Anthony Peters and Patrick Reasonover. It'll be in this auditorium at 4.30. And the first one is Tank Man, it's about the guy who stood in front of the tanks at Tiananmen Square to keep them from attacking the, the students during, um, in 1989, two days before my wedding. We were going to go to China. We had to cancel, unfortunately. Um, and the second one is called Empty Skies, and it's about Mao's brilliant idea to kill all the sparrows so that the grain harvest would be greater. And as usually happens when um, somebody thinks they know how to control things, it didn't work. So um, I hope you guys show up for that one. We're going to have popcorn during the showings and then hot dogs to follow, I believe. And then on March 23rd, we've, we've changed our topic and our date for our third event. In room 351 upstairs, we're going to have three economists talking about free, question mark, markets are everywhere. So markets really are everywhere, but they're not always free. And so we're going to have a little discussion about that with Abby Blanco, Audrey Redford, and St Stephanie Hefley. But today's talk is also on the theme of individuals being allowed to follow their dreams. And we were at dinner last night, Raymond and the TK, and me and a few other people, and we're having a great conversation. And TK said, well, maybe Raymond and I ought to just have a conversation instead of me giving a talk. And so we're going to try it out. And so today we have um, Raymond Green. He's a Louisville native, UofL alum, former cardinal ambassador, and he's the executive director of undergraduate programs here in the College of Business. And so you guys should really get to know him. And he stepped into this position following a six-year run as principal at Central High School. And T.K. Coleman is an entrepreneur and also the director of entrepreneurial education at FEE, the Foundation of Economic, for Economic Education. He's best described as a passionate voice for possibility. He's a firm believer in the idea that freedom begins from within, and his life mission is to help people reclaim a sense of personal power in their everyday lives. Couple of things, you've got surveys that you received when you came in. If you're here for extra credit or reading groups or any other reason, you need to fill out the paper survey. But also importantly, there's a QR code at the top, and FEE, where, where TK works, would like for you to fill out that survey. It's a brief two-minute survey. So just take a picture of it with your phone and fill that survey out also, if you wouldn't mind. When these guys are done talking, we will have a Q&A session. And feel free to ask any questions you want, but keep them short, very short. If you don't, I'm sure one of these guys will, will tell you to get to the point. So TK and Raymond, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to your talk. It's good to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having us here today. I will confess, you all didn't come to hear me speak, uh, and it's a real honor. So I want to say thank you, TK, for letting me share the stage with you today. We had a fantastic conversation last night, and uh, you guys are in for a really, really amazing treat. Uh, one of the most brilliant minds that we've met here uh, in my time, and one of one of the best speakers that I think that you're going to enjoy. Uh, so one of the things that, that we've talked about last night, and even <clears throat> if we think about the theme for today is this idea of a dream and the economics of your dream. And there are a lot of assumptions that kind of come along with, with the idea of having you know, a dream and then understanding what is, what's the money behind that dream or what are the resources behind that dream. And so can you just kind of talk just maybe a little bit to start out about, you know, this theme and how that resonates with you from an overall perspective? Sure. So I, I probably should define my terms. What, what, what do I mean when I say economics? So when I think about economics, I think of what happens when our unlimited desires come into contact with our limited abilities and resources. We all have wants, 
We all have needs. And we all have this common experience that manifests in unique ways where when we go out into the world to try to satisfy those wants and needs, we encounter the problem of scarcity. There are things I don't know. And what I don't know limits my ability to create the results that matter most to me. There are things I can't do. And my inabilities, my incompetencies seem to get in the way of meeting my own needs. I have a limited amount of energy. I have a limited amount of time. And all of those things pose obstacles for me in my ability to survive and thrive. That's the problem of scarcity. Scarcity is a very important problem to deal with because when it comes to our dreams, how do we expand our sense of creativity? How do we improve our ability to create wealth? How do we improve our ability to negotiate the challenges that get in our way? That's something that we all have to deal with. And so the economics of your dreams for me begins with helping people cope and conquer the fundamental problem of scarcity. Then there's a second part of that too, and that is there is nothing that you will ever want in life that can be uncoupled from your ability to incentivize other people to cooperate with you. Some people might say, well, not me. I just want to be left alone. I just want to sit in my room and not have anyone bother me. And I would say, OK, well, in your case, you need to be 10 times better than everyone else at getting other people to cooperate with you. Because unfortunately, we live in a world where lots of people want to interfere with your life. Lots of people want to meddle in your affairs, to tell you what to do, to get in your way, to intrude in an unwanted fashion. And so you've got to figure that problem out. How do we incentivize other people to cooperate with us? And, and one of the reasons this is such an important topic, particularly for students, is because when you go out into the real world, you find that the way your knowledge is tested in school is not mirrored very well in the real world. And the kind of skill set it takes to succeed in the real world is very different from the kind of skill set it takes to succeed in school. That doesn't mean school is all wrong. That doesn't mean we need to demonize the process, but we need to be aware of these differences so that we can prepare for them. So one example, and we talked a little bit about this last night, is the primary way that we test for knowledge in school is what I call the interrogation model of knowledge demonstration. You're given an assignment, read this book, research this topic, and then at the end we give you a test. It might be an oral exam, might be a written exam, we might get creative with how we test you, but a test basically boils down to this, a series of questions that are basically a BS filter. They're designed to prove to the teacher that you are not lying when you said you read the book, when you said you researched the topic. And if you're BSing, you won't be able to successfully answer these questions. If you have engaged the material at a high level, having thought very critically about them, then you will be able to answer the questions. Now, the interrogation model for knowledge demonstration, that's very valuable in the real world if you're ever a suspect for a crime. If the police are talking to you and they think you've committed theft, they think you've committed murder, your ability to be calm and composed and pass their BS filters by proving to them you are not lying with logic and rhetorical prowess, that's very valuable. But outside of that context, no one else really cares about your ability to pass a test. In the real world, people really only care about how useful you are to them relative to the problems that they have, relative to the things that they're interested in. And that's a harsh sounding reality, but it's, an, it's a liberating one to understand because maybe you know more about Aristotelian metaphysics than anyone else. Well, in the real world, that only matters if you can somehow translate that knowledge into an ability to make someone else's life better. And that's the economics piece. So everything that you want depends on your ability to make yourself useful to other people so that you can be economically rewarded for that usefulness and in turn improve your ability to create the results that matter most to you. There's a Zig Ziglar quote, and I'm going to stop here in just a moment. There's a Zig Ziglar quote where he says, the best way to get what you want is to help enough people get what they want. So we all have dreams. And in order to fulfill those dreams, we have to be more than smart. We have to be more than educated. We have to be more than informed. We have to know how to economically incentivize other people to collaborate with us and cooperate with us. And how do we do that? By becoming masters of creating value and solving problems. And that's a piece that school isn't really structured to teach very well. 
and, and it's something that we have to learn. So you said a lot, and I want to yeah, yeah. kind of ask some follow-up questions on yeah. that, but I want to encourage I'll you I'll try all to keep to, the answer short. No, no, it's good. Time. No, yeah. no, it's great. Um, uh, has anyone ever heard of the four levels of listening? We talked about this last night a little bit. Um, I was in a fantastic training at Carnegie Mellon University. I want to share this with you guys and encourage you to you know, engage in the level of listening that you think is most appropriate tonight. I should have started with this. Uh, but the first level of listening is kind of like that Charlie Brown, you know, womp, 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 <laughs> womp, you know, that kind of listening. The second level of listening is yes or no. You know? And I think a lot of North Americans uh, live in this yes or no listening place where we listen to agree or, or disagree. Right, and once I've heard you speak for five minutes, oh, I know who you are, I know what camp you're in, mm -hmm. I know who you voted for, and then I'm either with you or not, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the second level of listening. The third level of listening is empathetic listening, and that sounds really good, and it is good, but there are some fallacies with empathy, and that's for a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. We may get into that today, maybe. Um, but the fourth level, which I wanna invite you to today, is listening to be curious. <laughs> Um, and there will be things that are said today uh, by either one of us or maybe a question offered uh, that may rub you wrong. Chances are that's a great question and it's probably the question you needed. Um, but I want to encourage you and invite you uh, to listen with curiosity. And I was, I, I, as you talked, uh, all of my educator yeah. antenna started perking up, you know, particularly yeah. on testing. But I want to go back to the scarcity topic. Yeah. We have many undergrads in the class, uh, in the class, in the room today and however many others that may be listening online. And I'm, one of the things that I see, as I saw it as a high school principal, I even see it now being here at the university for um, almost a year now, and that is a scarcity of vision, a scarcity of a dream, uh, or a lack of, of an idea of what could be. And I think about my own life where, mm. you know, when I was an undergrad, I wanted to be a music minister so bad. I wanted to see what my mom did, and man, that was gonna be my life. But then I became a teacher, and then, Somebody said, hey, you, you'll be a great principal. So I became yeah. a principal. And then somebody said, you know what? You, you might be good in higher ed. And here I am. Yeah. And so what would you say to, to, to this audience around this idea of defining a dream, holding on to a dream, having a vision for what could be in your life? What, what would you say to that? Mm. Yeah, so uh, I, I began by making a distinction between a desire and a dream. A, a desire is something that you want, something that you like, something you're attracted to something you're intrigued by. And the beautiful thing about desire is that it's not the, the kind of knowledge you arrive at analytically. It's something that you know viscerally. It's a form of embodied cognition. When you listen to a song, you know what sounds good to you. You don't need me to tell you what sounds good. When you taste the food, you know what tastes good to you. You know what temperature feels good to you. You know what's pleasant to you. And so you know what you desire through the felt presence of immediate experience. You have direct understanding of that. And that's, that's a huge advantage, that's beautiful. A dream is just a series of desires that have become crystallized into a vision. So over time, you accumulate experiences that help you become aware of what your desires are, and then you begin to formulate ideas about the kind of life you would enjoy the most based on your knowledge of desire. So you say, I, I think I like to, marry somebody like that. I think I'd like to have a job where I get to live in this kind of climate and work around these kinds of people and do these sorts of activities. And, and that's kind of what a dream is. The thing about dreams is the way you get them is not by rushing the process, forcing yourself to have them, or trying to figure out at age 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, what you want to do for the rest of your life, but rather by seeking out new experiences that give you the opportunity to discover interesting things about yourself. My main piece of advice I give to young people, particularly those who are stressed out about what they wanna do with their lives is, don't try to follow your passions, start by flirting with your curiosities. Because when you flirt with your curiosities, you get to know things about yourself without having to put on an act that says, I am committed to doing this for the rest of my life. Think about it in terms of dating. How do you discover who that person is that you want to spend the rest of your life with? It's not by going on a first date and saying, hey, are we, are we gonna do the thing? Are we gonna get married? No, that will ruin everything. Even if you know for sure, love at first sight, that this is who you wanna be with for the rest of your life, your life don't tell them on the first date because they're gonna see you as a stalker. <laughs> Keep that part to yourself, right? But you go on a first date and you use that as an opportunity to just get to know them. And it may be a terrible date, but that's okay. 
because you learn some things about what you like, why that wasn't a good match, and it makes you better for the next person that you date. Or if the date goes well, now you can do a second one, and now a third one. And over time, as you accumulate enough experience, you kind of know what you like, you know what you don't like, and you're in a position to say, this is how I want to live. This is what I want to pursue. This is my dream. And you can do that with conviction. And the beautiful thing about college is you're young enough and you're free enough to be able to try new things in a really low risk environment without having to make promises to figure out how you're gonna monetize it, without having to make commitments like I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. And I would encourage you all to do crazy things, so to speak, that have nothing to do with what you know you want or with your majors. Try out for a play, try choir, try, try intramural sports, try anything that's unfamiliar to you so that even if you don't like the experience, you'll pick up important pieces of the puzzle that will put you in a position later on in life to have a much easier time discerning what you want. So you don't need to know what your dream is right now, and you don't need to think about today's decisions in terms of what is my 40-year-old self gonna want. Chances are there's no way you can predict that That's kind right. of thing. Be fully present to the experience that you have now and use it to explore new possibilities. I haven't forgot this whole schooling and testing thing. That's, that's <laughs> still simmering over here on this burner. But you've, you've taken your hand at singing uh, yeah, at some yeah. point. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah. So I spent my entire high school career sitting in the back of all my classes just writing songs, mm -hmm. you know? And all I would do is just listen to R&B the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I just love music, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what I spent all my time doing. And there was a point where I said, you know, this is what I want to do. And, and I thought for sure, yeah. like, I'm going to be a singer and a songwriter. That's it. And I, I remember uh, one of my friends, Paige Kennedy, who is an actor in LA. He was the character U-Turn on Weeds. Uh, Radon in Blue Mountain State. Um, he called me up and he says, hey, American Idol, they're having an audition here in LA. You've got to come and you've got to audition, man. I, I think you'll do really well. And I was like, uh, I don't know, man. LA's a little far. I don't know if I can do it, you know. Eh, no, I'm not going to do it. He calls me up a couple of weeks later and is like, hey, they now have auditions in Michigan. That's where I was at the time. He okay. was like, that's not very far from you, man. It's in Grand Rapids. You should go and you should try out. And I was like, uh, no, nah, man, I don't want to do it. You know, I was just basically scared of trying something like that. Called me a third time. He was like, hey, look, they're doing auditions again in San Jose. This is the final stop. He was like, I believe in you so strongly. I am willing to pay to have you fly out there, put you up in a hotel. You have to audition, man. You have to go after it. You got to pursue your dream. And I was like, man, I never had anybody believe in me like that. Yeah. To the, you know, it, it's easy to find people who can tell you, yeah, follow your dream. It's incredibly hard to find people that are willing to write a check. That's right. That makes that easier to pursue, right? So yeah. he was willing to put his money where his mouth was. And so I said, all right, man, I'll do it, okay? I'll do it. And I told him that, and then I, I was like, I hung up the phone, like, I can't do this. Oh my God. At the time, I'm in grad school for philosophy, and I'm doing really well. And I knew that if I were to just leave at this time to go do that, I could possibly be putting my scholarship at risk. It just, it wouldn't sell well. So I went and started talking to my professors, like, hey, I've got this thing, this opportunity. What do you think? Now, Every single one of those professors, God bless them. I don't think any of them was trying to crap on my dreams or discourage me. They all said to me, TK, I think you have a calling to do philosophy. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> they said, you've got a really good thing going. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't ruin it, yeah. you know? Interesting thing is there were about seven professors they were all male. Every single one of them said that. There was a single woman in the department. Her name was Sylvia Culp. I never had her for a class. In fact, her door was always closed. I never even met her, okay? And on this day, after talking to the last professor, I'm walking down the hall, Dunbar Hall, Western Michigan University, and I get to Sylvia Culp's door, and for the first time ever, that door is open this time, and she's sitting at her desk. And I'm thinking, Maybe she will tell me what I want to hear. 
And so I knock on the door and uh, I said, Dr. Cope, I've never met you before, but I'm TK and I'm in the grad department here. And she said, okay. And I said, I have a situation that I'd love to get your advice on. She goes, well, I don't really give advice, but I'm happy to give perspective. And I said, okay. So I sit down and I tell her my story and she said this to me. She goes, do you know why Wittgenstein was such a great philosopher? And I said, why? She says, because he lived a rich life. Mm -hmm. He didn't just read, he didn't just think, he pursued his dreams, and he did a lot of risky, interesting things. We have enough people who are out there telling our young people to follow their dreams who don't know what it's like to pursue their own dreams mm -hmm. and take any chances. If you wanna be a great philosopher, you have to take the risk of living an interesting story. So can you talk a little yeah. bit, I don't mean to interrupt you, so can it's you okay. talk a little bit about, I wanna find the intersection of economics and failure. Yeah. And economics beyond currency. I mean, this is the Center for Free Enterprise, the College yeah. of Business, yeah. right? But there are other forms of, of currency beyond the USD, right? Yeah. It, particularly when it comes to failure and, and following your dreams and taking risks. I'd love to hear you kind of talk about, maybe even cite some of your own examples or just uh, maybe examples from uh, heroes and heroines that you have read about or learned yeah. about over the years mm -hmm. where in pursuit of a dream, in pursuit of an audacious goal, yeah. right? There's extreme failure. There's extreme, and you know, I've heard it say failure's a first attempt in learning. Yeah. And that sounds great. You know, that's a nice bumper sticker, and it may be true. It's true, yeah. But, um, but can you just kind of talk a little bit about maybe some experiences that you have had on this idea of the, the economics of failure and how those opportunities have, have propelled you forward even? Absolutely. So, so first, let's, let's define wealth in a way that goes beyond money, because wealth and money are not the same thing. In fact, wealth is what you are willing to give up your money for. If you Can you think, say that one more time? They didn't get that. Wealth and money are not the same thing. <laughs> wealth is what you are willing to give up your money for. If we couldn't do anything with money, none of us would care about it. If money was this thing where it's just like, hey, you hold on to it and you have it. There's none of us who wants money solely for the purpose of holding on to it. Even those of us who think we want it solely for the purpose of holding on to it only want it because we believe that at some point in the future, what we have held on to gives us an opportunity to give it up for the thing that we really want. What we really want, we want things like security, we want experience, we want freedom, we want autonomy, that's wealth. When you go to the barber and you give that person money for a haircut, that haircut is wealth. The way you feel about yourself is wealth. The money is what you were willing to give up for the wealth. The wealth is the thing that you did in order to put yourself in a position to have that money and the thing that you got when you're willing to give it up. Now, a another important distinction is between abundance and wealth. So uh, abundance is any situation characterized by a plethora of resources. If, if you go to the beach, there's an abundance of sand. You go to the ocean, there's an abundance of water. But if abundance were sufficient for wealth, then no one would ever be poor. But poverty is a reality. And in many of the most abundant places in the world, you have the greatest amount of poverty. Why is that? Well, it's because abundance by itself doesn't give you wealth. Wealth is what happens when you take the abundant resources of the earth and you mingle it with human labor. You mingle it with productivity, with imagination, with creativity, and you mold it, you shape it, you do something interesting with it and then you gift it to the world, and people look at it and they say, wow, that's fascinating. Can I give you something that is valuable to me in exchange for that? And so the way that we get wealth is through human creativity. What does it have to do with failure? Creativity is something that we develop by actually engaging reality. And that means taking the risk of failure. One of my favorite quotes about learning comes from Chalmers Brothers in a book called Language in the Pursuit of Happiness where he says, learning is the process of doing what you don't know how to do while you don't know how to do it. You can't learn unless you go beyond what you already know and you take the risk of sounding stupid, looking incompetent, seeming like a loser, and that's how you get competence, right? How do you get in shape? By being the person who shows up when you're out of shape. There's no such thing as, I'm gonna wait till I get in shape first, and then I'm gonna go get in shape. Nope, in order to get in shape, you have to look like what you are, the person that's out of shape. How do you get knowledge? You have to sound like what you are, 
a person that doesn't know what they're talking about, right? And so that's failure. It's the willingness to be vulnerable to the experience of saying, yep, I'm the incompetent person, I'm the ignorant person, and I'm going to show myself as I am so that I can get to that point where I master that skill, I master that topic, I get to look good, I get to feel good, I get to sound good, I get to know what it is I'm saying and doing because I was willing to be vulnerable enough to fail. And so failure is an essential part of navigating the creative process and becoming a better version of ourselves. There is no economic success without engaging failure. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. And I want to, uh, maybe just share a personal story to kind of segue yeah. back to this schooling topic and around testing and, and thinking and knowledge demonstrations of learning because all this plays a, a, a role in, in folks understanding yeah. um, how do I achieve my dream, right? It's yeah, really hard yeah. to achieve a dream without some demonstration at some point where you have to have value added and demonstrate yeah. it. And so while I was the principal at Central High School, we created this framework uh, for teaching and learning with these different competencies, but the bedrock of it was agency, student mm. agency. Mm. Uh, it was all built around Albert Bandura's work. And this fueled by this idea that if a student can make choices on their own, and I'm a Montessorian by trade, right? And yeah, so Montessori yeah. education is about choice and agency yeah. and um, uh, independence, but social interdependence. And this idea that you know I can do it on my own, uh, but at the same time, I'm better with other people in this whole concept. So I'd really love to hear, you know, just kind of love to hear your thoughts on this idea of, because of, I've heard you say, um, you know, give yourself permission. Yeah. You know, this whole idea around making the choice to say, you know what, this, this is where my life is, and I'm going to set a cause, I'm going to set a path. To, to redirect where my life is, particularly for those of us in the crowd who may have certain obstacles in our lives, yeah. whether they're self-imposed or through other mechanisms, whether that be, you know, whatever. There's all kind of barriers to make yeah. pursuing your dream hard. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that first step, taking that first step saying, you know what, mm -mm, I'm, I'm, I'm going forward on this thing. I'm gonna exercise my agency. Yeah, so, so two things. One, you have to reframe failure. I think. When a lot of people hear failure is this good thing, what they hear is, uh, we all know that failure stinks. We all know that failure is bad, but try to be positive about it. Nobody wants to fail. You know, nobody likes it, but just, just be an optimist about it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that failure is actually a good thing. I'm saying there is a version of you that is superior to the people that are sitting before me today and you don't get to become that version of you unless you engage failure and get to the other side of that. And take the risk. Take the risk. Take the risk, right? Absolutely. So, you know, with the American Idol story, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but one of the things, I, I failed, obviously. You would have heard of me. If, if, if I succeeded in American Idol, I wouldn't have to tell you who I was. They wouldn't have to read that bio, right? You didn't hear of me. That tells you exactly how I did on American Idol. I failed. There's no, oh, maybe you succeeded in this kind of way. No, there's no way to, my self-esteem is intact. You don't have to save me. I flat out failed. That's the reality of my situation. But here's the thing. By engaging that experience, there are so many cool things I learned. I know what the audition process is like. I met so many interesting people. I got a chance to see up front how an entire aspect of the industry works. I got a chance to meet people who work in that industry. I got a chance to make some new friends that are still a part of my life today. I had some other creative opportunities that came out as a result of that. But more importantly, I developed a certain quality of fearlessness because when you look at failure on the outside, it seems far more dramatic than it actually is. It seems far more dangerous than when you experience failure on the inside. When I, the, the most important aspect of that American Idol experience and every failure I've had is when you get to the other side of it, you go, wait a minute. I didn't even die. Wait a minute. Literally no one cares. No one cares that I didn't make American Idol. When I go for a job interview, when I do an event, there's no one that's like, yeah, but you failed an American Idol. It doesn't even matter at all. It's so undramatic and uninteresting. But what does really matter 
are all of the qualities that I picked up as a result of it. I yeah. take myself less seriously now. I have a greater sense of humor. I got important answers to my questions, and now I don't have to torture myself. I, I, I don't get to say, oh yeah, that, that would have been me at the Grammys had I had the courage to pursue yeah. my dream. Yeah. I know for a fact that that's not me, and it wasn't gonna be, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's a good thing. You yeah. get to move on and do other things. So. I, I wouldn't just say tolerate failure and be positive about it when you experience it. I would say look for situations where there's a good risk of failure and, and, and go about this in a way where you're not, you know, uh, walking a fine line between what's legal and illegal, or you're walking a fine line between what's gonna hurt you permanently and so on. But within, a, within reasonable constraints, seek out experiences where you know you're going to fail because you don't know what's gonna happen next. You don't know how to navigate that situation. And that improves your wisdom, your courage, your self-awareness, your sense of humor, your empathy, your social intelligence, and that becomes information, that becomes character, that you can transfer to whatever else you do in life. Yeah, yeah. I, want, I want to try to take a, a few, what, what may seem to be random thoughts and put them together, because I think they can work. Uh, because what you're talking about, and as, as I understand it, really speaks to what a person brings to the table, whether yeah. that's of their own company that they started, or whether that's an organization that they are a part of that they're joining. And those failures are, are now value added, that they're tools that's in yeah. your tool belt, you know, that's helping feed, that you learned, there are things that you learned there that's helping feed, right, in yeah. some way. And they all impact organizational culture, right? And so when we think about, I've heard it said that the culture of an organization is kind of like the immune system. It fights off the viruses, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And if the immune system is healthy, if your culture is healthy, you can fight off the viruses. You That's can't right. avoid them, like they're there, right? That's but right. when that culture's right, and the, what would you say around this idea of influencing culture in an organization based off of those failures and leveraging those experiences for a young person to, and so that's one idea, yeah, 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 yeah. right? Yeah. The, 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 the kind of subsequent idea is if I had my magic wand, you know, I would, I would um, have a schooling system that, that was performance-based around tasks and real-world problems where yeah. students were invited to, to solve the real issues of the day sure. to where we could tap into the talent and creativity um, you know, that we're missing out on, quite honestly, so the students can bubble in a test. Right, uh, and so if you could kind of have this idea of if, if you were to redesign testing or accountability or proof of knowledge even yep. in schooling, regardless of the setting, right? Mm -hmm. Homeschool, private school, public school, whatever. Just prove to me that you know, that you can do, that you can. But you'd also kind of marry that idea with, with this whole concept of improving organizational culture and, and, and leveraging your failures to improve culture. Do, do you see it, uh, an opportunity there, or are those just too, too radically far apart? I, I don't think anything is too radically far apart. It's, it's just a matter of seeing the connections, right? Um, as far as leveraging your, your failures to improve organizational culture, uh, one of the things I, I try to reinforce with my students is that uh, no one ever trusts or respects a leader who has no failure mm -hmm. and who isn't willing to talk about those failures. Uh, partially because we all instinctively know that failure is a part of human experience. And if you ever appear to be a leader that has no failure, then people know that somewhere you're not being honest, you're not being transparent, you're not being humble, and so on. And so it's very important that we, uh, when we're in an environment that's so focused on, on making us experts, and we're so focused on success that we're pushing ourselves to be great that we don't force ourselves to grow up too quickly and adopt the posture of authority too quickly that we skip that important vulnerability that's going to allow us to connect with people later on. Um, you know, uh, if you're working at a restaurant, for instance, and you're starting off as a busboy, uh, you're going to want to be the manager as quickly as possible. But it's important to realize that once you get to that position of being the manager or the owner, it's the fact that you took out the garbage and that you ran food that's going to make all the people who work for you actually trust you and respect you, right? So being a leader is more, it's, it's more than just having a position. It's more than just having the power to tell people what to do. It's also about having the ability to win other people's hearts and to make them say, ah, 
I love getting behind that person. I love following that person. And that's something that great leaders have. They leverage their failures to motivate the, uh, the people around them by leading with that vulnerability and transparency. If I were to redesign school, I, I, I think what I'll do is, is I'm gonna innovate around this question. I'm gonna give myself an additional option. I'm gonna give myself permission to color outside the lines here. I'm gonna say we don't have to be either or about this. We can simply acknowledge that school, like anything in life, is designed to do what it does, and there is nothing in the world that meets all of our needs, right? What's the definition of an unhealthy marriage? An unhealthy marriage is one where you require your spouse to be all things to you. That's right. That's a disaster. It doesn't matter how good your spouse That's is, right. right? You need other friends to be able to do things for you and have certain conversations with you. That makes your marriage better because you're not requiring that person to be everything. It's the same with anything else in life. Your job isn't the only source of happiness. Your school isn't the only source of education. What I would do to help people develop this ability to demonstrate knowledge outside of test taking mode is I would simply challenge people to combine their already existing patterns of, of consumption with real world creativity. So here's an example. You all listen to music. You all watch television or movies. You all read blogs and listen to podcasts. One thing you could do is take the opinions that you have and put them out there in a way that can create value for people in the real world. You buy a product from Amazon and you have a strong opinion about it, go write a review. Because now people in the real world can agree or disagree with you and you can sort of see how your ideas land on other people. But also if you think something is really awesome or something is a real waste of time, people that are on the fence about a buying decision that they're going to make can be influenced positively by the, by the things that you say. Or you can write reviews, you can write blog posts, you can record podcasts stating your opinions about things. We all have opinions, we all have uh, philosophies, we all have ideas and feelings. Instead of just putting it on a test that one authority figure is gonna see and give a grade to, why not write a blog post or record a YouTube video or create a podcast episode and put it out there for the world and say, hey look, here's something that I read for my class and I'm gonna make an effort to connect that with something that's interesting to me. Or I'm gonna tell you what parts really bored me or I'm gonna tell you if you're, if you're gonna read this book, here are some tips you know, based on what I would do if I had the chance to go through this class again. There's so many opportunities to create value for other people. If you take a class, I guarantee you this. Here's one thing that I guarantee you that will work. Take any class you've taken here, create a YouTube video where you review that class. You say, this is what my experience was like at this class. Here are the things I would do differently if I were gonna take this class again. I guarantee you, students at this university who come after you to take that class, they're going to watch that video. YouTube will and monetize tell other that about pretty it. quickly. That, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and you're making a difference, right? You're using absolutely. your knowledge to help people. Yeah, I'll, I'll share this with you, and I want to see see what you think about this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> after being a principal for six years, I came up with what I call the the trifecta of job satisfaction, mm. and, uh, and you know, this whole concept of job satisfaction, or it's related to pursuing your dreams and. and being content with the path that you're on. Yeah. But I call it this, income, stress, and impact, income right? Stress. And like if your income is right, yeah. you know, most of, most of us, like, this is the first thing we wanna know, like, how much money am I gonna make? Right, right. But what I learned after being a principal is you can make good money, but, still, but the stress not be commensurate with the money. Mm. And, and then you even start to, at some point, you question your impact. Right, and That's you right. say, how, how am I making a difference? Or in what ways am I making a difference? Mm -hmm. you know, or how is my work extending beyond um, you know, the, the, now, the here and now? Is, is right. my work extending into the next generation? You know, is, my, is my work extending beyond today? And so I, I would love to, if you, you know, if you could come up with your own trifecta, what, what would you say are, you know, are the key, maybe, not, maybe it's not three items, but what are the, what's the DNA? Hmm. What's the DNA? What's, what's the, what are the components you know, of, of, of getting on a good career path that's not just getting a good paycheck, although that's awesome, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but really getting on a great career path that provides you great impact, but also the right amount of stress. You know, we live in a day and age where uh, you know, mental health is bigger than it's ever been. Uh, people are burning out. We're in the great resignation. Um, 
you know, six years ago I had no gray hair. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, well, but you don't want some, but you want some stress, right? Bridges yeah. are made to handle stress. So you want some level of stress. You want to be able to say, I accomplished this task and I checked some boxes, all that. So what would you say, but that's my DNA, you yeah, know, that's yeah, my yeah. trifecta. From your estimation, what, what would you say are the characteristics or the DNA or the trifecta of being able to stay on that, I know what my dream is, mm -hmm. I know what it's gonna cost, I know, you know whether, whether that be financial or otherwise. What, what, what would you say is the characteristics of being able to stay on that path? Hmm. So I maintain the controversial position that passion still matters. <laughs> and, and, and I know now it's, it's very difficult to take that idea seriously intellectually because I, the biggest fad in self-help right now is to dismiss follow your passion as a stupid idea. And I've heard all the arguments on why I'm supposed to think it's stupid to follow your passion and I think it all comes down to a superficial analysis of what it means to follow your passion. Follow your passion does not mean people are going to throw money at you and that you're going to be successful just because you do what feels good. The root of the word passion means to suffer. And so to really follow your passion is to identify what you are willing to suffer for. And there are a lot of things that we say we're passionate about, but we're actually not willing to suffer for them. And so there's this etymological disconnect between our saying we're passionate about it uh, when you compare it to our refusal to make a priority of it. But I, I, I think passion is the right direction to think in as long as our understanding of passion involves the willingness to suffer, the willingness to make it a priority, and the understanding that to follow my passion means that I figure out how to use my passion to make a difference in the lives of other people. But when people talk about passion, it usually centers around what? What do I do? And so when we say, well, what is your passion? We think, well, I, want, I, I like baseball, or, or uh, I like music, or I like video games. But I like to think of passion in terms of four pillars. And it's, it's more than just what you love. There's a what you love, I enjoy baseball. There's when you love it. There's with whom you love it. And there's how you love it. So let me give you an example. Let's say you love writing, and that's what you dream of being. I want to be a writer. That would make me so happy. Well, it's possible to get the what right and to get those other variables wrong in such a way that your entire writing life is miserable. Suppose I'm your boss and I have the power to call you up at four in the morning and say, hey, I need an article on this topic that you don't even care about and I need it in the next 30 minutes. Well, you're still doing what you love, but the way you're going about doing it is absolutely miserable. And the guy that you have to work with in the process of doing it makes you absolutely miserable. That's not a good formula for a passionate life, right? So in, in our quest to create a career that we're passionate around, we want to think about those four factors. And, and this is why it's important to not just think about money. Being paid to do what you love is really valuable, but you want to think about company culture. Who are the people I'm going to have to be around? And that includes the kinds of customers that you'll have to serve. It's important that these are people that you either like, that you enjoy serving, or that you at least have the fortitude to tolerate. And you have to be honest with yourself about it. If you hate kids, I know that's not popular. I know that everyone is gonna look down on you, but it's better to be honest with yourself about it and not go into elementary education than to try to pretend that's what you love and then to be miserable and to take that out on the kids. They don't, kids don't need teachers who hate them. They need teachers who either enjoy them or who have a great ability to be patient with them even when they're unlikable, right? So think about passion in those terms. The last piece I'll say on that is I also think it's important to make a distinction between um, preference and leverage. So preference refers to what you like and the way you like it, all those details, right? Leverage refers to your negotiating power, your ability to carry weight. Your ability to walk into a room and say, this is how I want it, this is how I need it to be, and people are willing to accommodate you for that. Now, when you're young, when you're in school, you're in the first few years of your career, your preferences are really high and your leverage is really low. Your preferences might be, I love to live in, a, in an area where I have seasons, or I love to live in a place where the weather's nice, or I love a job where I get to work remotely, or I love a job where, where I don't have to sit at a desk or where I get to come in at 10 o'clock or I get Sundays off. Your preferences are gonna be high. You're gonna have a lot of things that you want. And I want you to remain true to those preferences. Don't ever abandon them, they're good. 
although be open to the fact that your preferences will evolve. Your negotiating power is very low because it's not very expensive to replace you. You're not able to say at this stage of your career that you have five years of real world experience doing anything. You're not able to offer that, right? You're, you're new. And so it's gonna be pretty easy to find other people that they can pay to do the job instead of you. So when you're starting off in your career, optimize for experiences that give you leverage over time, even if they don't satisfy your preferences in the short run. Think about that in terms of like, all right, here's a job. Maybe it pays me okay. I tolerate the pay, it's not great. Maybe I live in a place that I don't love forever, but I can put up with it for six months or two years. Maybe these aren't the people I wanna spend the rest of my life around, but I can, I can do anything for 24 months. But if I do this work, the kind of negotiating power it's gonna give me will be massive. I will be able to take it to other places and say, I worked with this person. I've managed these types of projects. I've done this kind of work. I would like to bring that to your company and they're honored to have you, right? And so think about your career in terms of not just your preferences, but also in terms of leverage and optimize for experiences that will give you leverage so that 10 years from now, you'll be in a position to say, hey, this is where I wanna live. This is what I wanna do. These are the kind of people that I wanna work with and you'll bring so much value to the table that even if that's inconvenient for other people, they will accommodate you because you're that economically valuable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we gotta transition to questions, but I, I wanna ask you one more because you, you talked about suffering. And you yeah. know, one of the things that's fascinating as it relates to sacrifice and, and moving you forward, what, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, if you're, <clears throat> I'd say 40 or so, you know, give or take five years, uh, and you live in this country, right? You're part of a generation if you're 40 or so and younger, right, yeah. then you have not experienced nationwide suffering, mm. right, in your lifetime. We've had pockets of suffering, sure. and, and, or maybe individually, but just widespread. And I, I'm comparing this to, for example, my grandparents, who lived through the Depression, right? Everybody got, everybody was suffering during the Depression, for the most sure. part, right? Sure. Or my parents, who were boomers, who lived through civil rights and Jim Crow. Look, everybody, that was yeah. not a great time for a yeah. lot of people, right? Yeah. But there's never, you compare those times to today, right? We're not, we're not familiar with suffering as a, as a culture, right? Mm -hmm. we're, not, uh, we're not by default made to be gritty because it's not coming from these external forces. And so what I'm hearing you say is like, you, we need to invite suffering in a way to propel us forward. Is that what, it, maybe in a way, or invite sacrifice in a way, because where else, do, where else do we get it unless some people have it because of whatever yeah. their, their life circumstances are, right? Yeah. But we've had pockets of it, but I mean legitimate widespread where the majority of the population is really suffering. I've not seen it in my 40 years. Mm. I've seen it in pockets in this country specifically. And so if we're gonna pursue this dream, if we're gonna move ourselves forward, it almost, we have to be willing to make, make that sacrifice, right? I mean, we, we have to be willing to, to say, I'm gonna say no to these things in order to say yes to these other things to move myself forward. Is that, that's one interpretation of, of what I'm hearing you say. Is that spot on or am I off the mark a little bit? No, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I say all the time that your life is not a reflection of your preferences. It's, it's a, the result of your priorities. You know, life isn't gonna give you something because you want it. It's going to give you something because you demonstrated yourself to be someone that's willing to pay the price for it, right? And everything has opportunity costs. And it's, it's the cost you're willing to pay that will determine the results you have in your life. Now, when it comes to suffering, though, I don't think you need to seek out suffering. Mm -hmm. I think life is very faithful. And it will make sure, <laughs> it will make sure that yeah. you will get suffering. Yeah. And, and, and we'll all get our own special dosage of that. Yeah. And, and none of us can protect one another from that. We're, we're going to get our suffering. Uh, you know, I, I don't teach people to follow their dreams because I believe when you wish upon a star, yeah. it makes no difference who you are. I believe if you follow your dreams, you'll be crushed in ways that you can't even imagine. I believe the only thing I can guarantee you is that every single one of you is gonna get your heart broken by life more than you can imagine in ways that you can't even predict, and it's going to stink. But what I can say is that life isn't about avoiding that, it's about finding something that makes that suffering worth enduring and finding something beyond that suffering that calls you to live through it, right? And, and that's essentially what gives life meaning. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, 
I can keep talking for a long time. Yeah, man. We uh, should give and them we a can, chance, right? You know, keep going for another 40, 45 minutes or so. But we have a fantastic audience with us here today. Yeah. And um, there's a microphone there in that corner and then also one over here. So if you have any questions, uh, we'll open it up to the floor and we'll throw back to what Steve said at the beginning. If you could keep your questions short, uh, then that'll help us maximize our time. And in fairness to the people who have questions, let, let's make sure it's a question, right? So, yeah. you suck, that's not a question. <laughs> I, I appreciate the opinion, but turn you suck into a question. Be like, hey, why do you suck? Like, just make it a question. <laughs> and tell us, your, tell us your name, and uh, if you're not from the University of Louisville, tell us what institution you're from and uh, what you're studying. Oh, hey, how you doing? My name's Jason Robinson. I'm actually the SGA president from Kentucky State University. I Welcome. study business administration. Welcome. And something I had, uh, I wanted to ask, I noticed that you clearly separated the line between wealth and uh, monetary value or financial gain. I wanted to ask simply, at what point do you uh, start taking whatever it is, your dreams or your desires, and start capitalizing on them for financial gain, if it makes sense? Because you will be wealthy if you're following your dreams. I definitely understand that. But like you said, uh, in in this interview as well, it's easy to find somebody to say, follow your dreams, but it's hard to find somebody who's really gonna invest. So at what point should you start investing in yourself? Now? <laughs> well, yeah. let me put it into perspective. Okay. No, no, um, that's, my, that's my answer, I wasn't <laughs> asking. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Okay, yeah. let me put it into perspective, because this one kind of hits home for me. Let's yeah. say you're a fighter who's just starting off, you know, never really had any bouts or whatnot. Would you just go off the gate and be like, sign me up for that, that $30,000 fight, you know, I want to get in it, knowing that you, you're you not necessarily ready, but it still holds opportunity. Yeah, so I think it's never too early. I think the moment to try to monetize your interest is now. Not because I think you'll succeed, but because I think the kind of feedback you'll receive from the world is far more honest and beneficial to you. So important economic distinction. Stated preference and revealed preference. Stated preference is what people say they want or what they say they would do in theory. If you take a survey and you ask people, hey, if I ran for president, would you vote for me? If I had a concert tonight, you know, I mentioned I auditioned for American Idol. If I have a concert tonight at 8 p.m., would any of you stop by? That's stated preference, your answer to that. And some of you might be like, yeah, sure, I'd stop by. I've got nothing going on, right? It's what people say they are willing to do when possibilities are presented to them in the hypothetical. Okay. Revealed preference is what people actually choose when scarcity and sacrifice are part of the equation. So if I say, how many of you would come to my concert tonight if it cost $100 to be there? Now all of a sudden, the answers are going to change. People are going to say, well, I, I, I'm kind of busy. I've got this other thing going on. Well, I'm sorry, I just don't have the money. Now the feedback that I'm getting about my concert is far more precise and it's very useful to me if I wanna figure out what it takes to succeed as a musician, right? You're not going to get the best feedback from reality if you're doing everything in terms of stated preference. Asking people what they think, imagining what the possibilities are, you're just not gonna know. But once you introduce that money piece and require people to pay for something, then they'll let you know. So if you say, I want to be a fighter, and I'm going to have a fight, OK. But what if you say, I'm charging $30,000 to fight in your league? Let's say you don't get it, and someone says to you, no way, you're not worth that. I'll pay you 15. That's knowledge to you. That's letting you know how the market values your skill. And it puts you in a position where you can inquire about that and figure out, what do I need to do to get to the $30,000 level. This is why I encourage people to never be afraid to ask for raises. People are afraid to ask for this because they think that someone being told no is some great tragedy, but it's not. You're probably gonna be told no, but you can then use that no as an opportunity to say, okay, so just in the spirit of transparency, this is how much I'd like to make. I'd love to know from you what kind of value would I need to create for the company in order to be worth that to you. And there's no one who isn't glad to tell you what kind of value you would need to create in order to do that. Now, when you look at that description, you might say, oh, 
that sounds like more work than I want to do. And that's, again, good for you to know because you can rearrange your priorities. Or you can say, oh, wow, thank you for that feedback. I know exactly what I have to do. Now I'm going to go develop those skills so I can level up in a way that allows me to make that amount of money. So always try to monetize things because the feedback you get from your failures will be more valuable to you than the alternatives. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Right over here. Uh, so it's my understanding that you described... Uh, tell, tell us your name and where you're from and all, what your major and all that. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, my name's Andrew Samuel. I'm a senior economics student uh, at Google. Awesome. Um, so basically, it's my understanding that you described the Google Analytics system as a mechanism for information. Um, do you think that is still the case even when we don't know why it is that we failed or how it is that we failed? And so that, that uncertainty of knowing how or why that happened creates some sort of distortion or information gap. Do you think it is still possible that we gain as much from this failure as we, I mean, of course we wouldn't if we knew why all the circumstances it is that caused us to fail. What I'm saying is that, is there a significant loss from not knowing why or how? So a couple of things here. So yes, failure is a mechanism for information. It's also an inherent part of the learning process, meaning that there's no sensible way to discuss what it means to learn without positing failure as a part of that. So failure isn't this optional thing that we can sometimes avoid. It's a necessary condition for learning. That's the first thing I just want to make sure it our understanding of failure is sufficiently comprehensive. I would say information comes not only in the form of understanding why and how, it also comes in the form of having better questions to ask. Sometimes you have an argument with someone and it seems like it goes nowhere and you never get to a point where you agree with anything, but as a result of that argument, you're a little bit smarter about how to ask a question, right? That's information, that's valuable information that can radically change your life. And so it's so important that we don't limit information to answers. Uh, information also comes in the form of being a better inquirer. The third part of that is I, I think you're absolutely right in that we don't want to assume that failure makes us better just because we experienced it. We want to engage our failure cautiously. We want to be mindful in how we engage that failure. And so we want to process that by asking questions like, hmm, if I had the chance to do that over again, what would I do differently in order to get a different result? What assumptions did I make that perhaps contributed to my failure? Was there something I overestimated, something I underestimated? Asking questions like that is a critical part of learning from our failures. It's not a passive process, it's an active process. Don't approach failure like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go do a bunch of risky things, and as a result of having failed, I'm gonna be really smart. No, failure is a part of learning, but it is not the totality of learning. You actually have to show up and be conscious and engage it intentionally. And can so, I add on to yeah. that? I, I would add and say failure, I think, also changes your appetite, right? And it mm. says, if you just think back to uh, anybody who's seen a baby, they don't have an appetite for anything but mushy food, but as they grow, as they mature, so their appetites change, right? So first they go from milk to real food, and or from mushy food to real food. And I, what I have learned in my experience is that anytime I've had grow, like big time failures, man, it just makes me a little more hungry. And it, and it changes my desire for excellence, it changes my desire to, uh, to be efficient, it changes my, it just, I have a different, I don't, I, have a, I don't have a better word than appetite than say, I'm just a little more hungry for this thing now than I was, now that I've had this, this failure, now that I've been kind of propelled forward in that way. Uh, another add-on, it also changes your appetite in the opposite direction too. Uh, when, when you're a kid and you reach for the flame and you mm -hmm. fail, okay, yeah. I don't know why that happened, <laughs> but I, I, I don't want any more of that. Yeah. Like right. you've reached your satiation for that reaching for the flame, so you know yeah. you're not gonna do it again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. My name is James Lecklatter. I'm from uh, here at U of L. I'm an econ and sustainability student. And I wanted to know that with the idea of failure as something that's super important, how do you outweigh that to a very like modern age of socialization and putting your failures out there with the knowledge of 
it's out there for the rest of your life. Mm. Are, are you referring to the, the fact that in this generation, failures are broadcast with much more publicity than they were perhaps when I was younger, and now it feels more risky because if you do something embarrassing, you might become a meme. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So I'd say a couple of things about that. The more embarrassing the meme, the more interesting the success story when success happens. Mm -hmm. There is no failure so embarrassing that it doesn't make everybody want to read the book or watch the movie once you figure it out and get it right, right? The real tragedy of failure is that we allow that embarrassing moment to define us. But you show me any book you ever read about some hero that you looked up to, or you show me any movie that you ever watched about someone who accomplished something great, and if you stopped or paused somewhere in the middle of the story, you'd find a moment exactly like that that was just outrageous or just terribly embarrassing. And, and, and that person probably wrestled with giving up as a result of it, but they kept going, they figured it out, and they succeeded, right? And if you, if you write a hit song, people are gonna say, wow, that was the person that got it totally embarrassed on American Idol. That's an even better success story, right? It's one thing for the good singer to write a hit song, but the worst singer in the world, everyone laughed at, then they worked on it for a while, and then they became a great singer, won the Grammy. That's an even better story, right? So, so keep the long view in mind that don't focus so much on failure, focus on what is it you are pursuing that makes the failure worth enduring and keep going after that. Because you, you kind of want a good success story. You, you, you want some failures that are gonna be interesting to talk about later on in life. But when you get that moment, you don't want to stop there. The, the, the second thing I would say is there are ways to take risk and explore the possibility of failure without putting your business out there. Just because something happens in your life doesn't mean you need to make a video about it. It doesn't mean you need to announce it to the rest of the world. There is such a thing as practicing something new in a safe environment. So if I want to learn how to dance and I'm not very good at that and I don't have rhythm, well, I've got to fail in order to learn and I've got to experience some embarrassment but that doesn't mean I need to invite all of my friends that are gonna laugh at me, totally roast me, and record it and put it on social media to the dance lesson, right? But I do have to be willing to be vulnerable in front of my teacher and the other people that are there in the dance class. So I, I, I think there are ways to seek out experiences where you're not broadcasting in a way that's too public. I don't know if that interference is. I think this point's particularly important for Testing, testing, all right. But particularly important for those of you in the room who are high achievers, I was never in that club, okay? But you know the high achiever who, who's the straight A student, who, who lands every job, who you know, lands every date, who, who gets everything that they go for, and then you get your first taste of disappointment, or you get your first, I think this message is what, what I'm hearing you say is really, really important, particularly on the identity side of things. And do you internalize that failure as who you are? And you can you kind of conflate or confuse your worth and your value with one experience. And I think that that's go, that goes a really long way towards particular. Like I'm glad that there's not social media when I was a kid. I mean, to have my foolishness documented, right? I mean that, or or just or just mistakes. And to your point, and to what I've heard TK say. If you're really pursuing a dream, if you're really going after something, you're gonna stumble from time to time, or you're gonna have these mistakes, but you, can't, you don't internalize those as who you are and, and something that kinda changes your value. You know? Absolutely. Hey, you know what, this is an opportunity for me to be transparent about one of my failures, because I'm not talking about this theoretically. I've literally lived that. Like, I, I, I have literally lived out that fear of being a public embarrassment that everybody's afraid of becoming. So. I appeared on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader. I, I was walking through a mall one time, and this lady stops me. She says, what do you do? I answered her, and she says, I want you to be on TV. And she says, I'm an executive producer at Fox, and I want you to be on the show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader. 
And I said, ah, oh, no, I heard about that show. That's where people get embarrassed for not knowing stuff, you know, that they should have learned in fifth grade. And she's like, hey, hey, don't, don't look at it like that. It's this really great opportunity and, and the kids help you and la da 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 And, you know, she, she talked it up. And I was like, ah, I don't really know. She's like, look, just think about it, okay? I'm trying to help you, kid. And she gives me a business card. And I go home, I talk to my roommates about it, I talk to my friends about it. They're like, dude, are you crazy? Like, that doesn't just happen. That's a real magical experience. You should do it. It's a one, once in a lifetime type of thing. And so I called her up and I said, all right, I'll do it. And I, you can go verify this on Hulu. You can see my episode. I literally <laughs> appeared on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader uh, with uh, Jeff Foxworthy. And I'm on the show. And you, you ever seen those TV shows where Someone gets on stage and, and they're confident as they get on stage and then the lights go on and they're just like, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. I didn't look like that, but I, internally, that's what I was experiencing. So I get out there and my first question was, TK Coleman, how many faces are on the side of a queue? And, I, and I'm like, uh, uh, okay. Uh, a square's got four sides, four times two is eight. Uh, eight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> Jeff Foxworthy walks over and he says, okay, TK, let's, let's make a cube together. Oh. Six. There's no excuse for that. I said eight. I, I wish I could sit here and tell you that the question that I got wrong was a respectable one, <laughs> okay? But that's the one that I got wrong. Yeah. There's no excuse for that. And I got that question wrong, and I was like, oh my God, I'm on national television. And I just said, that. And, and, and by the way, um, I don't know if it's still up there, but there, there was even a YouTube video where somebody just like edit, edited that part. <laughs> and in the comments, people were brutal. They were like, this guy right here, this is the reason why America is in such bad shape. It's stupid people like this. <laughs> they were so cruel, man. <laughs> now, in that show, you, you have like a couple of cheats, right? And so he was like, well, I guess you're using up your save on, on the first question. You can pick a kid who might save you if they answered it correctly. And, and I picked, uh, Cody was the kid, and, and he answered it correctly and saved me. Next question, I got it right, okay. Whew. Next one, all right, I got that right. The next one, hey, I got that right, okay. Here comes the $25,000 question. Woo, I got it right, okay, okay. Here comes the $50,000 question. Hey, I got it right. My next question, I got it wrong, but the way the rules were structured is that if you get the $50,000 question right, you can't fall below that one. So at that point, you can just take whatever risk. Um, the last question I got wrong was something like, um, what are the words at, at the bottom of the, the Statue of Liberty? Something like that. Anyway, here's the deal. I had a YouTube video of me getting that question wrong, and I'm an education director, okay? <laughs> And I, I lived that experience of being on national TV doing something completely idiotic. But guess what? First of all, I won $50,000, <laughs> okay? I, I, I'd go do that again for another 50 grand. Secondly, I got a chance to meet Jeff Foxworthy and have the most amazing conversation with him. Thirdly, I got a chance to be on national TV. I received so many text messages that night from so many people that were happy to see me, so many people that were proud of what I did. And it was such an amazing experience. And again, nobody cares that I got the question wrong. That's what makes the story interesting, right? And so sometimes the, the cost of embarrassing yourself in the short term, the cost of, of failing at something is the price you have to pay to live an interesting story to tell. And if you optimize your life for running away from those kinds of experiences and never being the person who goes through something like that, all right, fine. You, you, you never get to be the person that people look at with the funny face. But you also don't get to be one who tells interesting stories about their life. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, 
my name is Brooke Schmidt, and I am in the IMBA class. Um, I was born and raised here, uh, went to Miami University of Ohio undergrad. Um, so my question is, uh, I have two questions kind of related. Um, you said you studied philosophy, and so I also love philosophy. And so I'm curious, what are your favorite philosophers? Yeah, so. It's hard to narrow down from three. It, it's hard to narrow down, yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll answer that, that question in terms of, of thinkers that have influenced me whose, whose ideas or approaches to inquiry still play a role in, in how I process my experience today and, and also people who inspired me to go deeper down other philosophical rabbit holes. Uh, first would be Rene Descartes. Um, I, I read his uh, meditations on first philosophy and his discourse on method and uh, Rene Descartes' project was to try to overcome the problem of global skepticism. He basically begins by saying, anything that, I can, anything that I already believe, if I can imagine it being false, I'm gonna discard it. And I'm gonna tear down my entire edifice of knowledge all the way down. And I'm gonna see if I can find a belief upon which I can build an edifice of knowledge that can be traced back to strong epistemic foundation, so to speak. If, you, if you've ever heard that quote, I think, therefore I am, this is where it comes from because he, he's going down the list of doubting everything, everything that can be doubted. And if he can find a way to doubt it, he throws it out because he wants certainty. And when he gets to his own, the fact of his own existence, he says, perhaps it is possible that I think that I exist, but I'm really deceived about that. But in order for me to be deceived about my existence, I must exist in order to be deceived. So by the mere fact that I am thinking, I can know with certainty that I exist because either I am deceived about my existence, which means I must exist in order to be deceived, or I am not deceived about my existence, which means I must exist. I think, therefore I am. It's sort of like a philosophy professor who was teaching and one of the students raises their hands and says, professor, prove to me that I exist. And the professor says, and whom shall I say is asking the question? Okay. So Descartes, I, I really liked his approach of being intellectually honest and being very rigorous with himself and not being afraid to subject his most cherished beliefs to skepticism. I don't agree with everything that, that he taught or that he believed but that's an approach that I try to take with myself. I'm, I'm a religious person. Um, I, I believe in a lot of things economically or politically that may not be mainstream, but I'm always willing to allow those beliefs to be questioned, even past the point of what I'm comfortable asking myself, and I owe that to Descartes. You know? So his, his method of, it's referred to um, methodological skepticism, using skepticism as a method to improve you know, your own basis for, for claims to knowledge. Rene Descartes was a big influence. Um, I would say Plato as well, uh, particularly in his writings about Socrates, uh, most noteworthy, the trial and death of Socrates, the Socratic method, that process of inquiry still plays a, a big role in my life as, uh, today. And then I would say today in terms of living philosophers, George Lakoff, who is a philosopher of language, and does a lot of research on um, cognitive grammar and, and, and the way metaphor uh, plays a role in, in the way we process our experience, the way we understand the world and so forth. So yeah. uh, that's a pretty nerdy question, but hopefully I, <laughs> hopefully I answered it. Is that George, how did you spell his last name? Lakoff, L-A-K-E-O-F-F. -E okay, great. Um, yeah, and these aren't endorsements of everything they say, but you know, <clears throat> they're people that have influenced me one way or another. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. who are some of yours? My three favorites? Yeah. So, when it comes to philosophers, I, I have three books that have really impacted my thinking and ones that I like to draw back to um, day to day. And, I really have been thinking a lot about The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. Um, I really like The Little Flower by Saint Therese, which mm. talks about 
to root yourself in humility and even the smallest step forward is, uh, that's often not acknowledged by anyone, can be the most powerful, you know, integrity. Yeah. Um, then I really like, this is a more modern one, um, the art of not giving an F. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> to not be explicit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that that is like really helpful when like going into something like failure. Then you can really just like root yourself in like, well, what would I do if I didn't care about how anyone else would view me? Yeah. And I think that that's like a really valuable perspective to take, especially as young people, where yeah. it feels like it really matters what other people think of you and feel about you. When in reality, personally, I think it's what you think of yourself and feel of yourself that's the most important. That's really cool. You quoted St. Therese Lassou. Are you Catholic? Uh, Christian. Just yeah. Methodist, yeah. non-denominational. Yeah, cool. Uh, I, I was asking just because that's, that's a rarely cited name among students yeah. of philosophy, so that's pretty cool that you ventured into that. Yeah. Awesome. Great Thanks point. for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. TK, you know me, but the rest of the people, some of them also know me, and some probably won't like to know me. But in any case, <laughs> in any case, uh, my name is Babu Nahara. I'm here, professor of economics, and I teach this course, Economics of Happiness. Many of my students are here. So the question I have to you is this based on your talk today, that failures and success are to be judged by others. The criticism of others and the recognition by the others is the testimony of your failures and success. And the dream is personal. So if the dream is not for boosting your ego, then the success and failure question doesn't arise. Because if it's personal, all you care about is how you feel about. So the question of failure and success, to me, doesn't matter. So suppose I want to write poetry, and this is for my pleasure. This is my dream to write, just feel good about it. So if somebody else, doesn't review it and give a big criticism. I don't care. This I'm happy. I had my dream. And there is no ego involved. So all this, the talk, if you get rid of ego in all this, the question of failure and success to me is totally moot. Because why apology is so difficult to ask? Because it hurts my ego. If you surrender, in that surrender is no success, no failure. So, I mean, this is my thought. I thought maybe you can shed some light on this. Yeah, I, I don't see a dilemma there at all. Um, I'll, I'll begin by, by adding to uh, your initial framing of failure and success as something that is uh, defined by the reaction of others, uh, whereas dreams are personal. So I actually would include failure and success right there alongside dreams as something that's personal. So for me, success is not something that is defined or determined by society. My favorite definition of success is by Earl Nightingale, who says, success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal. Uh, when I talk about success, I think the most important aspect is each person defining what that means for themselves. You can be a success in my eyes or in society's eyes, but still be miserable. And, and in what sense is that success? So the real formula, if you will, for success is what I call the three Ps. Your preferences, your priorities, your principles. What are the things that you care about? 
what are the things you are willing to sacrifice for and what are your non-negotiables or rather what are your value, values? And for you, that might look like a life where you're not rich and maybe society says, ah, ha, 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 that person should be wealthier and, 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 and they're not successful. But if you're fulfilled, then that is what matters. And it's the same thing with failure. Other people can look at you as being successful, but if you're miserable and you're out of alignment with yourself and you can't even look at yourself in the mirror, then that's your own personal definition of failure. So I'll leave you with a, a quote from Howard Thurman that says, uh, ask not yourself what the world needs, but rather what makes you come alive, for that is what the world needs, people who have come alive, success and failure alike, just like your dreams, it's personal. And the last thing you wanna do is let society tell you what those things ought to be for you. You'll fall prey to the fallacy of mimetic desire. And that's where you get caught in the ego traps that you refer to. Success is about your own wholeness. Uh, judging by you sitting up here, that's the physical indicator that we're, we one more. Okay. One more. Make it short, make it short. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Blake Pacora. I'm a sophomore economics student here. Uh, throughout your talk, you talked about the essentialness of following your passion. And it seems like now more than ever, universities across this country have recognized that they offer a wide assortment of various degree programs, uh, like unimaginable 30 years ago. But there's also this issue of all these students getting degrees that aren't financially feasible and coming out of college and not being able to get jobs. Uh, my question for you is how can higher education do a better job of ensuring that students follow their passion but also accomplish things that are financially feasible and productive? Yeah, by, by, by first teaching students that um, following your passion in the mere sense of studying and doing what you love is not going to give you any advantages when it comes to money, but following your passion in the sense of striving to use what you love to solve other problems to people is the key to creating wealth. And I think schools can do a better job at talking about what it means to be indispensable. When you get a degree, you are pursuing a credential that lots of other people are going to have, and that's a foundation for success, but it's not a sufficient condition for success. Uh, success requires you to be indispensable. So what are you bringing to the table that other people cannot replicate, replicate other people can't emulate? If I write down on a sheet of paper all the things you need to do to be valuable, and I tell you to follow those things, and you go out and follow them, that's great, but there's a problem. I can take that same sheet of paper, give it to someone else, and as long as they're willing to get up an hour earlier than you, well then they can beat you to the punch, right? As long as they're willing to stay up later than you. You've gotta be able to go off script and do the types of things that no one can tell you what to do. Whatever greatness is, it must be that which goes beyond what is mandatory, goes beyond what is required of you from some external authority. And so what schools have to teach is help young people look within themselves and discover the things that are inside their own souls that make them indispensable that no authority figure can require of them. One of my favorite quotes by Timothy Speed Levitt, Levitch says, uh, there are secret places inside the human heart that know nothing of the outside world. And it is the job of the educator to teach students how to explore those secret spaces and discover the secrets of their soul for themselves. When you can bring that to your work, it doesn't matter what other credentials other people have because you're no longer competing at the level of I studied at X, I have a degree in X. You are now embodying an experience that no one else can replicate and you're saying I'm bringing the uniqueness of me to this company, to this organization and so on. Be indispensable. You already are, but you just have to figure out how to how to emphasize that, how to bring that forth, and how to make that work for you. I know we're out of time, but I'm, I'm gonna make myself present somewhere over here, and feel free to come talk to me, um, and, and I'll, I'll be happy to chat. Let's thank uh, TK for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you.